Good afternoon, and welcome to the Alabama Public Health Training Network. Thank you for joining us today for our program, ensuring appropriate follow-up for abnormal breast and pap smear results utilizing the tickler tracking system. If you have a question about anything being discussed today, please call or email during our broadcast. The phone number and email address are on the screen now and will appear again later in the program. Also, the handouts are available online. You will need to register for this program in order to access that material. I'm Beth Nichols. I'm the Nurse Practitioner Director, and with me today I have Tina Pippin, my Nurse Consultant, and Valerie Cochran, the Assistant State Nursing Director. I would also like to take this opportunity to welcome a new member of our Family Health Services team joining us today, Dr. Dina Maxwell, and she serves as the Physician Consultant for our Bureau. Thank you. Welcome. She's working with us part-time with the Wise Woman Program for pilots that we have started in Shelby and Tuscaloosa counties. Thanks again. Thank you. All right, so we'll get started with our program. And the purpose of the presentation today is to ensure that all the participants will be able to understand how to best use, to best make sure you follow all the requirements of the abnormal breast and pap smear follow-up. And the importance of correctly using the tickler follow-up and tracking system to reduce the risk of improper follow-up and provide safe, high-quality patient care. Also, we want to show you how to utilize the CHR1 to assist with ensuring anyone opening a CHR record will have the opportunity to see any risk requiring follow-up there on the record on the CHR1 and will be alerted then to check the status of any abnormal finding and what they, where they are in the follow-up process. Follow-up tracking requirements for Let's talk about the follow-up tracking requirements for the normal breast exam. When you have a normal CBE and you get your results, and so the first result we'll talk about is a BIRAD zero. The BIRAD zero is an inconclusive test result, and it requires follow-up diagnostic tests that will be directed by the radiologist on this report. The tickler card must be started when you get this BIRAD zero result until this zero result is resolved. So other BIRAD results are ones and twos, is the, is the two that are actually negative results and they require no follow-up. The follow-up requirements for a patient with a normal breast exam that has a BIRAD three, this follow-up requires further studies in the future. The radiologist will indicate on the report if a follow-up needs, follow-up testing needs to happen either three or six months from the date of that report. And this patient must be notified of this result. And of course, your BIREDS 4 and 5 are automatic referrals for a surgical um, evaluation as soon as possible upon receipt of these results. A tickler card must be started and placed in the follow-up system, tracking system, for the following mammograms. A BIRAD 0, a 3, a 4, and a 5. If the follow-up study following a BIRAD 0 results in a BIRADS 1 or 2, there's no further follow-up required and that tickler card can then be closed. The tickler card must also be started for a BIREDS 3, 4, or 5, and the information should be sent to the central office for the um, surgeon, for Dr. Thomas's review. Other information required to be sent to the central office when you send these results are the latest clinical breast exam, and the family history. 
That's for a bi-reds 3, 4, and 5. Now for a bi-reds four, uh, 4 and 5, you will have a surgical plan of care and possibly a pathology report. So those will need to be sent also. If a previous BIREDS 3 happens to re revert to a, a 1 or 2 follow at the 6-month follow-up, then this result must be sent to the central office for review also, and then will be determined if the can, record can be closed and the follow-up can be closed. So now let's talk about the abnormal clinical breast exam. When a nurse practitioner does her breast exam, and by her discretion and judgment determines that it's abnormal, then an immediate surgical referral is required and evaluation um, for using the referral form, the CHR5. A diagnostic ultrasound would be for a woman, ordered for a woman less than 30 years old, and a diagnostic mammogram would be ordered for the woman 30 years old and older. A tickler card must be started on any abnormal clinical breast exam referred to the surgeon, so for tracking purposes. <clears throat> as soon as the results are received, they need to be sent to, as soon as this abnormal result is determined, this information should be sent to the collaborating physician for review. A clinical breast exam results are to be sent, the family history, any surgical evaluation plan of care, any type of test including the mammogram of course and ultrasound reports, and a pathology report if it's indicated or if it's done. And then all progress notes that are related to this issue should also be sent so that we can follow the plan on how this patient has been following up. Now, occasionally we'll have a result that will have a mammogram or ultrasound report that the result will actually recommend an MRI be done. Women who are eligible for the ABC program must be evaluated by a surgeon for an MRI to be ordered and must meet at least one of the following criteria for the MRI to be covered. The patient is BRCA1 or 2 positive or has a first degree relative, parent, sibling, child that's BRCA1 or 2 positive lifetime, or a lifetime risk of 20 to 25 percent or greater risk assessment which is determined by the surgeon. Tickler cards need to be started on these patients also so that we can follow their plan of care and their um, tracking. For women who are not eligible for the ABC program, a referral to a surgeon is required for anyone with the MRI recommendation on her result or a problem-solving clinic. Any MRI performed must be done by an approved facility and the ABC coordinators will have that information. All information related to the follow-up of an MRI must also be sent to the central office. Women with, that are eligible for the ABC program and have a ductogram recommendation on their mammogram or ultrasound must meet the following criteria for ABC to cover this procedure. They must have a spontaneous bloody nipple discharge and they must have a mammogram or ultrasound with no abnormal findings. A tickler card also should be started for follow-up and tracking on any duct ductogram recommendation. <clears throat> now I'm going to turn it over to Tina and let her talk a little bit about the abnormal pap <coughs> smear follow-up. And Beth, you've done an exceptional job going through the breast abnormalities because they can be very difficult to understand and comprehend and, and know the what result we have, when we should start a tickler, what is abnormal. So that, that was helpful for me as well. And with abnormal pap smear follow-up, uh, anytime you receive an abnormal pap smear result, a tickler card should be started. The next steps that you would follow in that system depends a lot on what is in our uh, algorithms and our guidelines in the protocol. 
Now, for pap smear, it's very difficult because many factors play into that. We have age, uh, if they've had abnormal pap smears in the past, uh, what are their HPV results, are they high risk patients, was there a technical issue. So where we're talking about BI-RADS meeting a certain zero, four, five, our pap smears can be very difficult to determine what are the next steps. But anytime you have an abnormal pap smear, you should start a tickler card. Also, in starting a tickler card, the pap log must be checked weekly for outstanding pap results. This is imperative. Um, we need to make sure that we're receiving results and that nothing goes missing. So when you log in your other specimens and you're putting the test that you've done and you're sending off for that patient that day, make sure that you log in that you're sending off the PAP and then check that weekly to make sure that all your results have come in. And with the results that we're receiving now, they're coming in rapidly. So we should not have delays in receiving our results. Um, if you can't find a result, the lab should be contacted as soon as possible and any notation of not finding the results, information that's presented by the lab about finding the results should be documented in the CHR 10. So looking at documentation of results, it's very important that all results, all results that come into the health department must be date stamped and initialed upon receipt in the county health department. This is very important. So stamps, we need to make sure the stamps are changed daily, that it has correct date, and any time the results are received that they're stamped. The nurse practitioners are required to date and initial all abnormal results. Now this in no way slows down any or delays the process that we would begin with either our breast or our pap smear follow-up. This just says that all those results must be reviewed by a nurse practitioner. Um, again, all abnormal breast and pap smear results must be signed and dated when reviewed, and notes regarding those follow-ups should be written on the progress note, CHR 10, not on the report. And I know that from receiving charts into the central office, sometimes uh, there may be notations of needs referral or other notes that are placed there, but the documentation should be collected and noted on the CHR 10. Um, what needs to be done, uh, and then as we talk about going through the tickler process and the follow-up and the referrals, all of those need to be captured in the CHR 10. Uh, we don't want the result to become any type of notation and that other things be lost. So now we're going to switch in, if we talked about the abnormal results for the breast, the abnormal results for the pap smear, we're going to really get to the meat of this and talk about the tracking system for our tickler process so that we can make sure that everyone is doing the same process, we're all on the same page, and we're providing good and safe patient care. So I'm going to turn it over to Beth, and we'll kind of be going back and forth on some of this. Right. So Beth. Thanks, Tina. The purpose of the tickler tracking system is to ensure that the patient is notified of their abnormal results and recorded in the CHR as soon as possible upon receipt of these results. Tracking referrals to outside providers is also part of this process. And tracking the patient's progress of the follow-up for an abnormal finding, thereby knowing what the next step is. That's part of the, pro um, part of the purpose of using this trackler, tracking card or tickler card is so that it helps you know right where you are with this process of follow-up with this patient. Now this is a copy of the card. We have um, actually have a um, blank card here. Sorry, I should have, should have put that one up here. And I'm going to go to this and in case you can't see it very well on your handout. 
but this is your abnormal follow-up card. So we'll talk about this a little bit more as we go along to show you how to use this card in the best way you can. This card is just for follow-up. It's not for documenting, documenting all of this patient's follow-up and, and where they're going and all that type of thing. This is mainly to track this patient and know where we need to go from here. What's the next step? Did they keep their appointment? That type of thing. Okay? So when an abnormal result is received, you create this particular card utilizing a label. You'll put the label up in the top left-hand corner, and you will enter the date that the abnormal result was received, the result of that finding, and any action that was taken. Say you wrote the patient a letter, or you made a phone call, and you would write that on your card. And we're going to go into some actual examples here in a little bit and show you some uh, actual examples that we did. You can make a brief comment if you need to or any type of uh, follow-up information in the uh, comment section. And information regarding your follow-up, though, of course, always is charted on the CHR-10. You're, again, you may hear me say this uh, several times. The tickler card is just for tracking. All the patient's information, follow-up information, goes on the CHR-10, so you want to uh, make sure you make all your contacts that you've made with the patient, all the information that needs to be on the CHR-10 is charted there. Now, we have a locked box that I'll show you one that I actually have that I wanted to show you for illustration. <coughs> You need a locked box to file your tickler cards. These tickler cards can be ordered, and I'll tell you in a little bit too about where to order those from, from the warehouse. But a five by eight card is the better card. They do have the index card size, the smaller ones, but you can't get much information on there, so I wouldn't recommend you use the little small ones. But your locking box is what you want to use. If you do happen to have a box that you're using that does not lock, then make sure that you store that lock in a locked cabinet. You want to make your dividers in your, in your box with monthly and then weekly dividers. And I'll show you again in a little bit about how to do that in my illustration. Results pending uh, div um, divider is also helpful if you use one um, when you use this system. So you place the tickler in the appropriate section of the tickler box, and you check this file at least once weekly at your follow-up times. When you're allowed your follow-up, you pull the records of the patient, and when you uh, are doing your follow-up, to see where, the, where they are in the process in case the card did not get pulled at the time the patient came in, and then you can update your card, but you can see exactly where you are and what's the next step. And again, of course, all this would be recorded on your CHR-10. It is essential that the assigned person have the time allotted to work the follow-up. If you don't have enough time to get your follow-up done, you must let your supervisor know. Everyone using the same system will ensure that we are all know how to come in and pick up this system. If you are are the follow-up nurse and heaven forbid you should have an accident and have to be out then someone else can come in and pick up right where you left off that's the whole purpose of, of us all using the same tracking follow-up system so that we can have someone else come in and pick up if and when the need should arise it is imperative that we use this tracking system for good patient care and practice that results are reported in a timely fashion. Tickler cards can be ordered from the warehouse through the Procurate system, and that is the um, order number and all on your slide. They come in packs of 100, and these cards are to be kept, again, of course, in a locked file due to having PHI information. To close a tickler card, 
when an abnormal result has been resolved as a result of following through the, um, rec the required follow-up chapter, all the requirements in the follow-up chapter, or if you have exhausted all attempts to get this patient in, as described again in the follow-up chapter, then it can be closed, the tickler can be closed. Once the follow-up is closed, the card is placed on the CHR, in the CHR on the left-hand side behind the support documents. So there's actually, you'll need to punch a hole in the card, take everything out, and put your card in, put your other stuff on top, and then put your little tab thing back down, and that will stay in that record. It needs to never be purged from the record. If a record gets uh, some information taken, you know, when they get so thick and you have to remove, uh, purge some of the records when the old information, but the tickler card should always stay in the chart. Any chart with, a, with unresolved abnormal follow-up must be flagged. So say when you have a patient that didn't do what they were supposed to do. They had a BIRADS 4 and they never went to see the surgeon then you need to flag that chart on the CHR1, make a notation so that if that patient does come back in, whatever staff member happens to see this patient when they return to the health department, they will have that note in red notifying them, oh, I need to check with them to find out where we are in this process or if further referrals need to be made and that type of thing. So just as a reminder of when you keep a tickler card, you start a tickler card for an abnormal clinical breast exam. For any abnormal mammogram, that would be a mammogram that is not a BIRADS 1 or 2, and for any pap smear that's abnormal, regardless of age. Be sure to notify your ABC uh, coordinator of anyone that you happen to get a result of a positive test for cancer on either a pap biopsy or a breast biopsy. This will help to ensure that the patient's process for application, Medicaid application, gets started as soon as possible. So now what we'd like to do, I'm going to let Tina introduce our next uh, speaker and we'll talk a little bit about that CHR1 and some other things. Um, thanks, Beth. So Beth and I uh, have been working closely with um, professional services and with Valerie trying to pull the pieces all together. So we've talked about abnormal pap smear, abnormal breast results. Now we t need to talk about, and, and we've talked about the tickler system and the tracking system, an overview of that. So we need to put it in practice. And in putting it in practice, we realized there were some other pieces that we were missing. Um, and how to incorporate and use the CHR1 to make sure that we were able to capture the information and also some other documentation uh, things that you would like to talk to. So Valerie, thank you so much for being here today with us. You are welcome and thank you and um, that all makes a lot of sense to me and I even now can, I think I can do a breast follow-up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would like to say that um, you know, we have pushed back the revision of CHR forms for a long time because we kept thinking the electronic health record was coming. And we still think the electronic health record's coming, but through no fault of our own and circumstances that are beyond our control, we still don't have an EMR, but we're still working on it. So the Bureau of Professional and Support Services um, we're going to work together to update some outdated CHR forms that need, need some tweaking before the EHR is a reality. But I did want to go over a few things about the CHR that really we, we need to look at. Um, you know, we, we keep talking about um, trying to, you know, our quality assurance. You know, we want, we want to see more patients and improve our um, return on investment, that kind of thing. But the, the problem is we can't set aside quality health care just because we need to improve our revenue. 
So um, we're going to try to give you some tools to kind of help to, to see when the patient comes in what you need to be looking at a little better. Um, some of the issues that we're having with the CHR, uh, late entries are being made without the proper documentation. Also, errors aren't being um, corrected correctly. And when new forms are inserted into the CHR folder, they're not put in the correct place. They're just stuffed in. And, you know, we have um, a method to outline that. And uh, unfortunately, we all get in a hurry and we say, well, I'll do it later, and, but it never gets done. I, this morning I was picking up trash that my husband dropped around and I said, my God, no wonder I have to do all this work because he will not put something in the trash. So just put stuff in the right place when it's yours to put in there and <laughs> it'll, it'll help that. Not that our CHRs are trash. Not, no, no, not okay, that they're trash. Sure. Um, also, We've noticed that information from, from previous visits or new orders are being overlooked. When the nurse um, or the nurse practitioner looks for, through the chart, and I will say this, that I may use nurse and nurse practitioner interchangeably, um, but you don't look back through the whole chart, so therefore you really might be missing something. And that's why we decided to go with a revision of the CHR1, um, and we'll go into that in a second. First of all, I want to tell you about the documentation of late entries. Uh, you know, we all know that if it's not documented, it's not done. We have got to better document the way that um, late entries are made because I have seen things like um, add. Um, I've seen no documentation at all, just something comes in, no date. So if you... In the CHR folder of the document library, there is a subfolder uh, entitled Medical Record Charting. If you scroll down to the bottom of the, of the, the CHR folder in the, in the document library, you'll see it down there. We are working to revise that uh, so it's a little better understand because it's been there since 2005. So we kind of think it needs some updating. You need to enter, when you are documenting something that it, that occurred at another visit or if you're coming down and you know you finished with the date and everything and you realize there's a late entry, you need to write in the word late entry, not add, uh, more stuff, whatever. You need to write late entry. And then also enter the current date and the current time. And then also you reference the date when the information should have been included. And the entry must be signed. Um, I will say that if you are, if you have done your documentation and you realize right after you've signed your name that you forgot to write something, you can put the date in and write it again and, and sign your name completely again. You don't have to write late entry, but this is speaking about stuff that comes in like late in the afternoon, the next day or whatever. The next thing I want to talk about is documentation of errors. Uh, the correct way to document errors is also found in this same place uh, on the document library in the medical record charting um, subfolder. Remember that correction fluid is never used to correct documentation. And you know, as nurses, we kind of know that, but maybe there might be some, some other people in the clinic that might need to know that. So no correction fluid on a medical record ever. Uh, to update the record, to uh, make it correct, uh, we're gonna institute the, the following, in which some of this is already in that, that um, document on the document library. The person making the error must also correct the error. We had an incident where a nurse gave uh, some pills to a patient and uh, they were given in error and so the nurse practitioner came after that and saw that the nurse had already done that so instead of calling it to the nurse's attention for the nurse to fix she just struck through it and then underneath it wrote what she gave the patient, which was, the, of course, the correct thing to do. 
the person that makes the error needs to correct it. Therefore, the nurse practitioner should have taken the chart to the patient and asked the nurse to line through it and also write the word error above that. You scratch through with one line because it still has to be legible. Line through with one line, write error above the text that's been lined through and the date and time and the initials of the person making the correction because their signature is already on that same, should be on that same entry. Um, in a, really, the nurse practitioner could have just left that whole statement there that the nurse gave those pills, and she could have come under it and said, um, these pills were given in error and you know, they were taken back from the patient and I did so and so and so and so. So that would have corrected that error, but don't line through medical records that, that are pertinent to the patient's care. Uh, I did see a chart the other day that um, in, they, they were talking about lab problems and they said due to difficulties and they struck through difficulties about three or four times and then they wrote issues. You know, difficulties, issues, that might be the same thing, but let's don't use the medical record to um, talk ugly about our family. And so, you know, just write their lab issues and because of that, this is what happened. You know, don't, let's don't air our dirty laundry in the chart. Okay, adding new forms to the CHR. Tabs were purchased for the CHR and you can get those separately. It doesn't matter how many you buy of each one. However, there is an order that those tabs must be placed in when they're used. Now, all of them don't have to be used and there should be protocol for that, but I can find it nowhere. <laughs> so I'm taking on my mission to come up with a CHR um, order uh, and put it back into the um, document library so we'll have something actually written. It, it's, I had a CHR manual at one time and it was in there, but I can't tell you what happened to my CHR manual. So anyway, we're going to work on that. Uh, make sure everything that's on the left-hand side of the chart is supposed to be on the left-hand side of the chart and it's either above the supporting documents tab or below the tab. So make sure all everything in there is correct. So once again, we're going to work on that. So we're coming down to the CHR1. Um, I sent out, I emailed a copy to all the area nursing directors and all of the area clerical directors just so you would have a copy to see the draft that we're working on. It's been going back and forth for a while and we've, we've pretty much got it fixed how we need it. But um, if you have any comments, I will take comments about it from anybody until Friday and after that it's going to be set in stone. So if you've got a comment by Friday, let me know. So for a long time, the area nursing directors and uh, nurse practitioners have discussed having a problem list on the CHR. We realized that we just didn't want to invent any more CHR forms since we are going to get that uh, electronic medical record. We are. I'm going to retire in three years. We're going to have one for them. <laughs> but for the purpose of continuity of care, we have decided to use the, the CHR1, which is the patient log, in a way, and I think um, there's a copy down here if you guys want to show it from the overhead. Uh, Beth has a copy down there. Uh, of course, it's going to still be used for the regular purposes of putting the um, Falcon labels on it. Uh, we have also, we've moved allergies back onto this form because this is pertinent to the continuity of care for that patient. Also, if for some reason the patient does not want to be contacted, you do have a stamp for that and you can stamp that uh, either above patient log or below patient log. I will tell you that 
Some of the counties told me that the top of the form gets pretty messed up and they ask if they could put it underneath the allergies line and I t said, you know, I think that's fine. We, we need probably to stick with one thing. Mm -hmm. So we're going to discuss that internally. But if you've got a idea about that, please let us know and we will um, take those into consideration. Also, we're going to use it um, instead of having the, the line that used to be there for student participation, you, that's just going to have to be written in where it says uh, visit type and relevant patient information. And some people had some comments about that and, and we, were, we were trying to be sensitive to that. However, we just felt, felt like we needed more room to write the pertinent patient information and you should be asking the patient at every visit if they would like to have a um, student or not. So, and we'll have some uh, examples of that in a few minutes when, when uh, Tina and Beth go over this exactly. Um, as far as document allergies though, I have not seen what protocols from different programs there are that say you have to document allergies on their forms and um, if that's still pertinent to the patient care when, when that visit's being done and it needs to be on that form, we're going to look at that because I think that, you know, we don't need a bunch of documentation in different places. So we will look at that, but this is just a quick fix for now. So please understand that we've got to get the rest of the programs on track with this. And I will say, you know, this focus is on family planning and um, breast and cervical health, but really good quality patient continuity of care. This is for every program. It's not just for them, which I'm understanding that WIC doesn't use CHR anymore. So from now on in the, where it says uh, visit type relevant patient information, anything that is very pertinent to the patient's care for their upcoming visits or follow-up, things like that need to be documented in red. I know some counties told me that they, when they put a um, release of information, they document it in red. That should not be in red. It should be in black or blue ink. The only thing that should be in red is uh, anything that's pertinent to ongoing and to the next visit. Uh, green ink, we're going to use that when it uh, gets to the point where the, um, th the information that was recorded in red, if the issue is resolved, we're going to write resolved in the date and the nurse's initials on that. And then when new CHRs are added, I'm mean, excusing CHR 1s are added, anything that's in red that has not been resolved with green ink is going to be brought through up to the next CHR 1. And we realize that this may be um, a little bit, um, you know, it's not something that we've always, we've ever done before and it's new and it's going to take some time, but we feel like that so much information has been missed. And, you know, we see every ARIA report from every county health department and a large majority of the errors are just because something was missed on the chart. So we feel like this is going to help. Uh, so the clerical staff can write in the allergies. They can bring the allergies forward. However, the first nurse that picks up the chart after the new CHR1 has been added needs to bring everything forward. I will tell you, I've got a couple more things to say. Tina and Beth are going to go over some examples, and please call or email if you need to. But I want to reiterate that this is not a progress note. Everything needs to be very brief and to the point and needs to be what's pertinent to the continuity of care for the patient. It um, also serves as an organizational uh, tool in, in conjunction with the tickler file and, and Beth and Tina are going to go over that. So it's just an at a glance thing and like I said, I'm going to take comments till Friday. Uh, we'll come up with the, the very last thing and then we'll get the CHR, go through the regular CHR channel um, 
Jessica Hardy is over the CHR and she has approved this methodology. It's just we she needs to send it out through the regular channels before we actually go live with it. But there's no reason why today you can't r start writing on the CHR1 uh, what needs to be done in red. So Tina and Beth. Okay. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to get to some practical scenarios and even though uh, I know before we get started uh, th there may be it never happens like that so <laughs> but if we started writing in everything that happens we'd never get through the satellite training today so looking at utilizing the CHR1 in the new um, protocol to try to make sure one to make sure we're looking at what needs to be done, things that are outstanding. Also, um, looking at any changes that are significant that may be overlooked within the chart. Because as Valerie alluded, we're seeing that there's so many different places that things can be written that a lot of times it's missed. So this is going to be a family planning patient. Um, this patient uh, is coming in. We've written here that the patient is allergic to penicillin. Um, we will have the label that will be put over here to the right. So for today, I don't, uh, and hopefully you can, sorry y'all. Well actually Tina, these forms are printed out of Falcon, so the initial label will be already printed at the top. Okay. That's why it's, it's like, Additional and can I add thing. one thing before? Oh, I'm moving, I sorry. Meant to say, <laughs> moving I'm, closer to me. Yeah, I meant to say, we do not want to see any sticky notes on charts anymore. This, when, when, we, when you say the chart is flagged, the CHR1 is the flag. There are no more sticky notes, so. Thank you. I was going to ask that later, yeah. but That's thank right. you, Val. <laughs> okay, so for this patient, on July the 1st, 7 one this patient is coming in for a family planning initial visit. So it's the first time this patient has come to us for an exam. Okay, so during that time, the patient is evaluated by the nurse practitioner. Uh, we do the complete exam, all the uh, needed lab, which includes a pap smear. And she is seeking a birth control method. And during that time, the method that she is, we've determined that is best suited for her is Depo. So, uh, what is also added up here is that her method that was chosen was DEPO. And, and Valerie had alluded to this, and I apologize I didn't say it. This person did not, had no student, did not want a student involved with their care. And so the person that uh, asked that notated it here with their initials. Okay, so our initial family planning patient has had an exam has uh, received DEPO as their birth control method. And then when you're looking at DEPO, again, you're looking at when's the next time they need to come in. Um, and on our, you have your wheel and you determine if they received it on 7-1 that uh, allowable date and date that works for this patient is gonna be to return on 9-21-15. Now, I'm gonna switch gears for just a second I need to go to the slides because this is another kind of uh, I hate to word, use the word issue because it, it's negative but there has been a lot of errors with depo injections being giving, given on the wrong dates I mean it's just they're they're given too early um, they're missed uh, there was an order to discontinue the depo and it was given anyway. So let's just, th this is the, what we have determined is the safest thing for the patient, it's the safest thing for our nurses, it's a good standard of practice. So from now on, any time a depo injection is given, it must be documented on the CHR-10. And this will be updated and included on our uh, updates to our protocol in the manual. So this doesn't matter when it is. So what? you're talking about using the stamp, using the family, the, the stamp the on stamp. the CHR-10. Okay. So you would use the stamp or, and you know, really, if it, let's say they're coming in for the initial, 
you're going to have all that documentation on your CHR 12, the A, page 1, page 2, the B. And a lot of times, I mean, it, it just depends on when I've been reviewing charts, whether or not it was at the bottom of the page 2, uh, was it put in the orders, you know, the nurse practitioner wrote the order, uh, depo provera injection, IM or sub-Q, Q 12 weeks times one year, and then actually writes that she gave the depo provera injection. So that can be missed, it, depending on if the nurse gave it uh, and it wrote it on the C, I mean the 12 B. Pa B. B, or if the nurse practitioner wrote it on page 2, or if someone came over and wrote it on the CHR 10. Um, so using the stamp and putting them all on the CHR 10 will have a sequential order for these depot injections so that there's no doubt when the last injection is given and if it's due. So this will be a change. Um, I, I don't see it being a big change because the only time that you would kind of vary from what you're doing now is if they're actually in there for an exam and you're writing it on some of that documentation. But it's just way too confusing because I've seen the exams, I wasn't going to talk about this, but exams deferred. The depot wasn't given. They came back the second time. They finished the physical. The depot was given. It was missed and it, it was, depot was written everywhere. So this is just the only way for us to make sure that we're given these in a sequential manner. Um, so if we go back to the, our patient log, we have here that the patient received depo and the next gen injection is going to be due 9-21-15. Okay, so during that time, of course she's had an initial, we get her pap result back and find out that she has an abnormal pap. So we, we get the abnormal pap result. We take it to the nurse practitioner, let her review it. She signs it or initials it, dates it. So what we're also going to do is we're going to start a tickler because now she has an abnormal pap. So we have Susie Sunshine because I'm all about being happy, you know. And additional information, this could be anything. You know, you know what your patients, what will be helpful when you're trying to contact that patient. So for my for Miss Sunshine, you know, the best contact number is her cell number. And the best time is after 3 p.m. because that's the time she works. She doesn't get off until then, and she'd rather you call, call, you, call her on the cell. So what I'm going to do is on 7-13, I've received this abnormal path. Now, this would be the actual result. Uh, if it's ask us, I mean, I could go through everything, HPV, positive, but this is where you would write the actual abnormal finding. Okay, and then you're going to write what action was taken. So on 713, a letter was mailed. And in that letter, we told them to follow up on 720. So I have started a tickler card on this patient because she has an abnormal pap smear result. So this is what I've done on the tickler. But also, I've got to make sure that I document all that information in the CHR 10 because that's your progress note. So you're, this is just to start your tickler. So on 718, the patient actually comes in for her problem because she has an abnormal pap smear. And so I'm going to pull her tickler card because I've put it in for this date, which is just a week later. And she's still in for the same thing, which is an abnormal PAP result. And I'm going to make a cold poll referral to Dr. Jones. And the date I made that referral is for 8-10-15. So then you would file this uh, tickler card in the second week of August because you're going to follow up then to see if the patient has kept their culpo appointment. Again, this is just to know what's going on with tracking. I would go back to my CHR 10, document that patient came in for abnormal PAP results. 
information discussed with patient, referral, all the information that you give, appointment made, all of that is noted in the CHR 10. So on uh, up here where we had on 713, you'll see that it says abnormal PAP and letter. Okay, this is where we're talking about utilizing again the CHR 1. And hopefully people receive the instructions. And under the instructions, if you look in uh, under 2B, it says you're going to use red ink to document all abnormal labs, findings, follow-up, treatment, and test. Okay, so what I've done is I've documented in red the abnormal finding as well as the follow-up. So on 718, I'm also documenting the treatment, you know, that we're, are other tests that are needed, because this is in red. So we have to keep tracking what's going on with this patient. So even though we have the tickler card, this lets anybody know that picks up this chart, okay, this person's had an abnormal pap, and they've been referred for a culpo. And the next time they're returning back to us is on 921. Okay, and they're coming in 921 for what? Depot. Depot. So if we look, so again, even though we've got 810 for the culpo. So remember, we've got different things going on. You've got your patient coming into you for services, but you're also using the tickler system to make sure you don't lose them for follow-up. Okay, so on 921, this patient comes back in for a supply for her depot. She's right on time. So for that depot, she's given the depot, and it's noted on the, where are they going to document her depot? The CHR 10. So you're going to go to the CHR 10. You're going to use your stamp. You're going to put your depot. So for just focusing on the depot, we've got the depot that's given. The next date for her to come in for her depot is on 12-10 of 15. Okay, so she was supposed to go for her culpo on 8-10. So while she's in, we pull her tickler card and we find out that we received her culpo result on 9-1 of 15 and her culpo's negative. And the recommendation is from the physician is to repeat the PAP in one year and to return to routine screening. So her next appointment with us is going to be her family planning appointment on 2016, but now she's closed to follow-up because she's returning to routine screening. And you'll see here, close follow-up. Okay, so I know that that's not it usually is not resolved that quickly, but we're trying to, for, for time and to simplify this a little bit. So here, we're putting that this has been resolved on 9-1 when we received her culpo that it was negative. So that's in green. So we know at this point, her pap smear follow-up has been resolved. And her next pap is due 7-1-16, which is when she's going to have her annual exam. Okay, because on, you know, if we look at it, we're trying to ingrain any issues resolved along with the date and the employee's signature. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my tickler card and I'm going to put, oh, let's see, two holes in the top here or on the side. I was going to say it's on the side. You'll put two holes here. You'll put that, move it over to the left-hand side of the chart and put it under supporting documents. You would never remove this from the chart. This is, this must remain in the chart, but this is closed to follow up. All right, so our patient has now, we're, we're doing good with the PAP. She's lucky, she's had the culpo, it was negative, and we're going to just be repeating her. So on 1017, she comes in for a problem. Okay, well, she's not due for a depot until 1210. So 
what's going on with her. Well, today she's coming in because she's having breakthrough bleeding, which is common with Depo, but she's also complaining of headaches. She's having a lot of headaches, you know, and so you're concerned about what's going on with her. So the nurse practitioner's there that day. She's referred to the nurse practitioner. The nurse practitioner will assess her thoroughly about her headaches. What type of headaches? When's she having them? Is, there, is she having an aria? All that information should be documented. And it's going to be documented on the CHR 10. And on this date, the practitioner feels that the best thing for her is to switch over to another method because Depo is not the best method for her. And because we're probably going to try her own progestin only pills or pops because she could still run into problems with the headaches on the COCs. So on this, because this is a change in her status, we are putting Depo D seed. So anybody that picks this chart back up will know, okay, if you, know, if you just keep seeing Depo, 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 and you see, then she comes back in for a family planning supply visit, you'll see that she's not on Depo anymore. And she comes back, and we make an appointment for her to come back. We give her three packs of pills and tell her to come back uh, on 110, 16, or as needed if she's still having problems. So on 110, she comes back in for a supply visit. Pills are working great. We're doing great. And we give her, her enough pills to last her unto her until her annual exam. Uh, and then the final is she comes in for her annual exam right on time. And it's okay at this point for her to see a student, and that's initialed. So this goes through just the scenario of how we're going to be tracking the abnormal results as well as changes in orders because there have been times where orders have changed, it's been missed, and medication has been given when it should not have been. Again, this is not the progress note. This is only to document, you know, in red, again, follow-up, treatment, orders, changes in orders, change in patient status. All of this information, anything that's gone on here, is not replaced by documenting it. I mean, not document it in the CHR 10. So that's the PAP follow-up, and I'm going to let Beth switch over to her scenario, and let's talk a little bit. Okay. Were, Beth, were you I say got something? a question okay. Okay. Um, that came in. I feel like okay. um, Marge Payne, or uh, for y'all that don't aren't from here, you know, <laughs> Romper Room, when they used to hold up a mirror, I see you out there. I see you. Um, so I see you, Angie, and Arlinda, and all these people. But anyway. Um, question, do you use the system, so like say you referred the patient for uh, an abnormal thyroid, is that recorded on here as well? Do you, ha if that's not something that you would normally follow up on, just routine, do you, would that be put there too? If the test result if a test if a test is ordered that's going to impact what we do for that patient if it's going to impact her birth control method or if it's going to um, impact how we care for her mm -hmm. then that does need to go on the on the on the CHR1 okay if she's just got an earache and we're refer, referring her to a GP then that's not something that we want to no, put on that it's form. not okay and in the instructions that you have Valerie do help with that because it says document any patient specific orders that must be followed at subsequent visits so if she had a thyroid problem we're going to definitely address that at the next visit so noting it there would be appropriate. Okay, and I do have a question before you get into that other one that is about um, breast, breast stuff. Okay. Um, may we continue to do an ultrasound in combination with diagnostic mammogram on patients um, 30 years of age and older? Uh, in the past, certain surgeons have requested an ultrasound in addition to the diagnostic mammogram. Therefore, this became a standard of care and also expedited treatment and care. 
there's no problem with ordering the ultrasound at the same time the um, diagnostic mammogram is ordered. Most of the time, the radiologist will make the determination if he feels the um, an ultrasound is indicated. Um, but there's no problem with or if you feel like it feels real cystic, and and it's probably going to need a ultrasound if it feels cystic to the nurse practitioner. So if you determine, if the nurse practitioner determines that an ultrasound is indicated, that's fine. Okay. Thank you. That's so all we got questions. so far. Good questions. Good questions. Yes. Okay. I just turned that over, but here we go back to it. Okay. So we're back to the patient log here because we have a patient that came in for her cancer detection annual on June the 25th. She had her cancer detection annual and had a mammogram. She had a screening mammogram. So the screening mammogram result came back and was abnormal. So what do we do? We have to start a tickler card. So here we have the results that we received this result was on June the tw uh, July the 10th for this BIREDS 4. We sent her a letter, and she was to return for referral on July the 17th. On July the 18th, the nurse, pre the nurse doing the follow-up uh, pulled the record and realized the patient had not shown up for her uh, referral. So she wrote here, no show, certified letter sent, and that this was the date she was to return. Now, we want to always make sure that we document in the CHR 10, you know, like I said, some of these things we're going to repeat over and over, but we just want to make sure it's clear that this is not the patient's record. The patient's record is, is to be documented, this information is to be documented on the CHR 10. So here, we will come in on this same date that we had Note, uh, noted this result, we came in and wrote July the 10th that she had this abnormal result and that the follow-up letter was sent and this was when she was going to turn in, return and here she is, she didn't show and we sent a certified letter and this is the date she was to return. This patient actually, believe it or not, came back on July the 24th, the date we told her to, and we made a surgical referral. Don't pay any attention to the green right now. She, we made her surgical referral. She's not actually due back again until here, so that's the reason for this date. This is her next actual cancer detection date, but this is still in red, so anyone picking up this chart knows that we need to check on the process of this, this follow-up. Okay, so she gave her an appointment when she came in on July the 24th. She made this appointment with Dr. Smith for August the, tw August the 14th. On August the 15th, the patient came in for a DCS. This is one way I wanted to be able to show you how this could be helpful because the next day after she was supposed to go on for her surgical evaluation, she can, person seeing this sees this red stuff here and says, hmm, let me see what the status is on this follow-up. And she looks in the progress note and she sees that this patient had an appointment the day before for her surgical evaluation. So she says to the patient, did you keep your appointment yesterday with the surgeon? No, I didn't get to make that appointment. I missed that appointment. Okay, so now we know we have to get her tickler card back out, get her rescheduled so that she can be rescheduled. We've got her sitting in front of us. So if we hadn't had this information here, if we hadn't had this information in red here, it's possible that that may have been missed on that day because we're concentrating on her DCS problem. So the, the purpose of that was to get her rescheduled in a timely manner. We got her right away. We got her rescheduled for August the 25th. We get the results back of her biopsy and this biopsy was negative, and she's to have a follow-up 
in six months, a follow-up diagnostic mammogram in six months, which would be due in February. So th we would go back to the CHR1 and record this, that she's actually due for this in six months, but this is resolved. Her surgical evaluation is resolved because she kept her appointment August the 25th, and I initialed it here. So what I want to show you now is how to use your tickler box. I'm going to put this here. This, I bought this handy dandy little box at Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> and you will see it is actually a locking box. Again, like I told you before, if you are going to use any type of box that does not um, lock, then you would have to keep that box in a locking file because it has PHI information. Now, you see here that I have the months are in here, January, February, March. I don't have all the weeks labeled in here. I just didn't have time to do all that. And, but this is what it would look like. All your months, sorry, all your months should actually have week one, two, three, and four. Each month will have that in there because that shows you where you need to put your card each time you're doing your follow-up. So this lady that had her BIRADS 4, um, July the 10th, we got the results of her BIRADS 4, and we sent her a letter to come in for her, um, b to be referred for her surgical evaluation. So we would go here to July. See, I did number this one. So we would go to July, and we would put her card. She's due to come in for her referral on July the 17th. So we would go to week two, put her card there in week two of July, so that when you do your follow-up that week, you would know whether she came in and kept her appointment or not. So if you pull this card out, you pull her record, you see, nope, she didn't keep her appointment. And that's exactly what happened because this nurse actually had her follow-up on July the 18th, and she saw right away that she didn't keep her appointment. So you send her another letter to come back, and you send her a certified letter this time, and she's to come back the 24th. So then you move her card into the third week. So then you know when she came in, we pulled her card out because she came in on time and we have made her appointment for her surgical evaluation. Now I talked about it earlier about having our results pending. What you can do with this is now that she, you know that she is going for her culpa, we're waiting for the results of her culpa. I was going to say. Um, <laughs> She's going for the results of her biopsy, her breast biopsy, and so her surgical evaluation. So we're going to put her in the results pending tab, behind the results pending tab. So when you go through your follow-up each week, you would check behind your results pending tab to see if there's anything delinquent on any patient that you need to contact. And you would go to today is, we're going to say, Today is July the 30th. So I'm going to pull back my week four of July. Of course, if you got any in here, you need to be looking at those too because they shouldn't be in there. So, What's your name? so if you look here and you've got any cards here in the, the weeks previous to that, then you know you need to get those out and follow up. But this is a week, this way when you're doing this weekly, you know where you are in your follow-up system for each patient. You've got each week's ready. You move them as you, if you need to move this lady that is going to have her um, six month, now that she's had her um, biopsy, you came here and pulled it out from behind the results pending tab. And now she's going to have her follow up in February. She's going to have her six month follow up in February. So you go to the first week in February. I'm sorry. You put this here so that 
in February, six months from now, you will go that first week in February and you say, oh yeah, she's due for her follow-up six-month mammogram now. I need to get contact her, make her appointment so she can go for her appointment. She gets an appointment to come back to go for that. You make her appointment. She's going back two weeks later. She's going for that. So you're going to move her card to the appropriate week for that. I got a question. Mm -hmm. So on results pending, do you put the tickler cards on results pending only when you know they've kept the appointment for that procedure, test, whatever? You can do that either way. You can, if you would rather just keep it in the weeks, you know you're not going to miss it because you're pulling mm -hmm. those out for each week if you'd rather do that. If, and then you find out that she did keep her appointment, mm -hmm. you can move it to the results pending section there. Because I know it takes us sometimes mm -hmm. a good bit of time to get results from right. on culpos or right. other tests, so I wasn't sure. Right. And that, that is, it, the, the results pending tab, you can use it. Or you can just use your weeks because you know when you should be checking on that patient. You know when you need to be checking on that follow-up uh, process to know whether or not, okay, you know, she had her appointment on the uh, 15th of, of August, so she can move that card to the um, week, at, that week of the 15th of August so that when that week rolls around, then she can go in there and pull that out to see if, if the card didn't get pulled that week, that second week when, uh, or third week, whatever the 15th is, the, uh, say the, it gets moved and it didn't get moved, that means either she didn't come in or the card didn't get pulled. So you go, you know, you go pull the patient's record, see if the appointment got, if she kept her appointment, and then you'd know to document. Again, this is not, this card is not meant to be your CHR 10. It's not meant to replace any documentation that is needed on the CHR 10. All your follow-up needs to be recorded there. This card is strictly to keep you on track with knowing where do we go from here? Where am I needing to go from here? The purpose of this is so that anybody that picks this chart up, just like when this patient came in the day after she was supposed to have been for her biopsy, her surgical evaluation, whatever, um, it was found right away because we had the, we would possibly had a missed opportunity to get this patient rescheduled if we hadn't had this information here to remind someone to check and see where they are in their follow-up process. Beth, I do have a couple of questions okay. that have come in. Great. Um, I can feel the angst coming through the iPad here. Please clarify, when a patient is in the clinic for an exam and the NP gives depo, is the depo documented on the CHR1, the CHR10, and the CHR12? Not on the CHR12. We want the depo given every time a depo is given we want that to be documented on the CHR 10 for sequential. We can have each, each depot is going to be documented on the CHR 10. Now, when the nurse practitioner writes her order to say this patient can continue this, you know, for a year, however, and she says, uh, depot given CCHR 10. That's where the stamp's going to be. That's where it's going to be listed that it was given. I realize that this may seem like it's a lot more work, um, but you don't know how many errors we've been seeing. So um, we need to do this to correct so that we can have a sequ sequential um, date-driven documentation of when these depots have been given. Okay. Another question. Should all mammogram result reports be reviewed by a nurse practitioner and initialed or signed? No, it says on, the, on your notes, you'll notice that it says abnormal results are to be initialed and dated by the nurse practitioner. Normal results are to re be reviewed by the nurse, but any abnormal result is to be handed off for the nurse practitioner to review. And initial and I, I did have a question about that. Because
because earlier, and, and I know um, it's probably not what you intended, but it, it, there was a slide that said that if it comes back, I forget if it's a, a four or five, then they have to have a surgical cons, uh, consult. But the nurse practitioner has to tell the nurse to do that, or can the nurse go ahead and order yes. the uh, surgical consult. The nurse does not have to wait for the nurse practitioner to review. We do not want that to delay any um, any process for this evaluation. It's in protocol. It's written in protocol that if a patient has a BIRADS 4 or 5 that they are to be referred to the surgeon. So that's not required that the nurse practitioner write on that before that appointment or that contact is getting started and the tickler starts and all that kind of thing but you I mean sure you want to show it to them the next time they're there but in some cases if they happen to be off it could be two weeks before they're back there they were here yesterday or they were here two days ago and now they're off next week so it's gonna be two weeks before they'll be back and here you've got this result you needed to refer so if the uh, it is in protocol that a BIRES 4 or 5 is to be referred to a surgeon, and they don't have okay. to have the nurse practitioner's order to do that. And then for pap smears, you know, it, they don't have to wait for any type of signature, just or just, order, or order. Just go ahead and it, move ahead with the follow-up. Right, the way it's listed in protocol. Okay. That's all, right. all the questions that have come up. Anybody else have a question in the audience? And I know that there's some uh, case studies we put in there that can just help you kind of go through as review. We wanted to make sure that we had time to use these practical uh, representations of the CHR1 and the uh, tickler card so that people could really look at how it should be completed. Uh, you can use the um, case studies just to kind of look at how you would file and it, it can help test your mind and make sure that you got it right. And I hope that I was clear on how to use the, the uh, tickler box and all. I liked having this one. This is similar. Uh, well, mine was a lot different than the one that I used to use when I used to do follow-up, but I like this one better. Um, but the, what I liked about having the box like this was because when you're doing your follow-up, you're able to take that box, sit it right on your desk, pull your cards out. You can close it back up. It's locked. It's secure. You go pull your files. You sit back down, and you're able to, to work it and file your cards right there and keep everything in order and keep your... Um, keep your system going while you're working on it because that's that's the way it's going to work the best. I believe we have a phone call. We do. Caller, go ahead with your question. Yes, I do. My question is, if you have electronic medical records, how does the follow-up picker and the patient log fit in? Well, that's something that um, we realize needs to be done along with a pharmacy inventory system and we have worked diligently on that and that will be part of it I'm, I can't give you the specifics of it but all I know is that it's going to be automated when we have an electronic medical record it will, will definitely be addressed and yes. all that will be very it will be a hopefully it will be a, a lot less tedious task as far as uh, following up on, on things because of the uh, electronic record will actually have what we're planning on having is um, having some um, alerts and that type of thing that would actually pop up when the, um, when the records are open and also pop up for the uh, nurse that does the follow-up. Okay. Good question. Good, good, good question. question. Anybody else with any questions in the audience? So, Valerie, I, I know you've had some notes today that you, you made about, will that be included in the other information sent out? Are we going to, about the documentation or? Uh, we'll, we're getting okay. everything together and that'll okay. be going. I do have another question. Oh, sorry. Um, okay. Why would we use the revisit stamp when an annual initial is done and the depot is given same visit? Why can't we just write the depot given on the CHR-10? If we use the stamp, we have to fill out it out completely 
and that is redundancy. And I have to agree with that. Why would you put more information than you need? Well, we can talk about that. We can we can discuss that and de determine if um, if it just needs to be as long as it's documented on the on the uh, CHR, CHR 10. ten. And I suppose it could be documented that. Uh, uh, depot was given on, and you write the date that the depot was given on this date at the family planning annual, or that type of thing. That's a good. That's a good thought, and um, and we can talk about that, and we'll let you know about that. Yeah, and the, the guidance will come out on that. So Ooh, it's just question. making sure that we don't miss that it doesn't get overlooked. Okay, this is a follow up to uh, one of the questions about no, documenting on. on all those forms. Since all depot is to be documented on the CHR 10, if the NP, NP gives a depot for an initial annual, does the PT plus 3 have to be documented on the CHR 10 and the CHR 12B? This is duplicate doc documentation. I think that we was, just, we well, just talked about mm -hmm. that. I got a call or two. Yeah, we have another okay. phone call. Okay. This one's from Tuscaloosa. All right. Caller, go ahead with your question. I guess we're all having that. I guess we're all having that same question as far as the redundancy in the CHR 12 and the CHR 10, because that was my thoughts too. Like when we stamped it on the CHR 10, could we just write CCHR 12? But of course, write that the depot was documented there. But my other question was on the CHR 1 on the patient log. Are those blocks going to be bigger? Because I noticed when you all gave examples, it was, seemed like there was enough space for you all to write yes, in green, that, red, and black. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. depending on the handwriting, that wasn't going to go over too well. It is going to be bigger. Um, we, we did fix that, but this was just what we had going at the time. So, so there will be a little bit more room over there. They've moved it down in graphics. And um, so, uh, yes, that's... Shifted because it. we're yes. actually all great minds think alike. We're removing the um, the column where the um, student about the student. Mm -hmm. So that's what has allowed us to have more room uh, under the visit. Um, so once, once once that's removed. Well, I guess I asked that question because that example in the course materials is that what it's really going to look like, or that's not what it's going to look like. That that is uh, like a draft. And uh, we we can start. We you know we can make those lines bigger. That's that's not a problem. So your your comment is taken, and we will work on that. I promise you, I'll do that tomorrow. And then my other question about the students. So if students are in the building that 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 day, that's when we ask if it's okay for a student to have to document that. Or are you saying it needs to be documented every time? Every time. If there's students in the building that are going to be participating in care, then you would. If there's not students there, don't worry about it. But if there are students that, that are going to be seeing patients that day, you do have to ask them. Okay, and document that. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. You're Good welcome. Question. Uh, question, uh, does a patient have to come to the clinic to be referred? No, they do not have to come to the clinic no. to be referred. No, you don't have to. If you say so you can... Um, get in touch with them on the phone and that would just be a difference in what you document on your card that you spoke with the patient you've set them an appointment up and of course all that would be documented on the CHR 10 but you would also document that on your tickler card that you that uh, phone call appointment made patient notified and and again you want to be as brief as you can on that card you want to be as brief as you can on your tickler card, but yet give enough information to know where you are in your process, in your follow-up process. Okay. okay, that's all I have. All right. Well, if we don't have any more phone calls or any more questions, let's see. He's coming back in. Got one more. Got one more call. Now, just that's good. Second. All right. I think this has been good to this training and talking about practical issues that you're having in the clinics. We want to be a resource so that we can talk through how to best take care of our patients. So we're so glad that people allotted time for the nurses and staff, nurse practitioners and others to uh, participate in this. We want to work smarter, not harder. 
Yeah. And um, so this, that's the whole purpose of doing all of this, is so that we can help you to be able to take care of your patients um, in, a, in a way that's very organized. Okay, we have a question from Calhoun County. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Our question was, um, you just said if that a patient doesn't have to actually come into the clinic for a referral, does that include abnormal pap smears? If you speak with a patient on the phone and they, um, and you let them know the results, you have to document those results that were discussed. Any, any information, this would all be on the CHR 10, that you have discussed the results with the patient and that an appointment has been made. And, and okay. Even with a positive HPV? considering that's, that's an STD? Well, well, the problem, we could get into a lot of different scenarios about results, and I really don't want to get into that. Um, I think we want to stick with what is the result that we had and what kind of follow-up do they need. Um, it's good to counsel patients okay. in person to provide them the information and to reinforce the importance of them following through because so many times our patients don't follow through when they need treatment. Um, well, I, I don't. You may have information, you know, pamphlet that you would want to provide them and that kind of thing. And if, if it's a hardship for them yeah. to come in, we don't want to delay them getting any type of, um, of treatment or, or testing done because they are having a hardship of getting in. And you can always mail them a um, pamphlet, like the pamphlets that we usually give them uh, in the clinic. So that would be possible to do that. Uh, it's yeah, all in course. whether or not you feel comfortable with that patient when, the, when they're, you feel like they understand the seriousness of this situation and the seriousness of their following up as, as directed. That's a good okay. question. Good Thank question. You. We have another phone call. This one's from Coffee County. Go ahead with your question. Hi, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is um, for the referral process. Um, the referral process, when they sign the referral for the abnormal PAP, that also gives us permission to send their PAP results to the provider where they're going to follow up for like culpo biopsies. And so when they sign that, that also gives us a release of information from that patient. And so if we do it over the phone, how are we able to send like PAP results to the physician's office with that, without that release of request? If you will pull your policy on um, compliance and HIPAA, uh, it may be first page, second page. It tells you, I believe, that if it is for the care of the patient, you do not have to have the patient's permission to send that physician uh, the test results. Okay. But that is um, in my, a policy. Okay. And then my second question is a lot of the patients that I refer, they don't know where they want to go. They don't have a physician. They don't have insurance. They don't have a physician. They don't know if they want to go to a local provider. I also offer UAB Culpo, but at that time, they're not really sure what they want to do. And so this is a question about making appointments for patients. If they're not really sure what they want to do and we don't make them an appointment, how do we go about that? Um, well, I think each patient, of course, will be different, but we we need to make that patient an appointment. And at some point, we're going to have to, you know, pick somebody locally or with the UAB clinic and say, this is imperative that you get this follow-up test done. We need to call and make you an appointment. Um, so I think, will we go ahead and make the appointment before we talk to them, after we counsel them, or how would we go about When, when you're counseling them about their result, you would go ahead and attempt to make the appointment for them. And then because you just you can't lose that maybe the last time you got them on the phone the phone's disconnected so doing anything we can with the time that we have with that patient so I would go ahead counsel her about the results make the appointment and and follow through 
And my last question is regards to phone calls. A lot of the patients that I call, their number's been disconnected or they don't have a voicemail and there's no answer. So on the CHI-1, do we do a phone call attempt times one, no answer, no voicemail? And do we write that in red? No, you don't have to write all that in red. You just document that on your CHR-10. You're going to send them a letter. If you can't get a hold to them, um, if you cannot get in touch with them um, by phone, then your next step is to send a letter. So um, you can document on your CHR-10 that you attempted this phone call, but I wouldn't keep you know, calling, calling, calling. You, know, you can try to call them. You get the result. You try to call them. You didn't get an answer. So you send them a letter, and so okay. And if the letters return undeliverable, because this has happened to me quite a bit, if the letters return undeliverable or it doesn't reach the patient, mm -hmm. then do we also record that on the CHR one once we get that return receipt as undelivered or the, ret the actual first class letter returned? That's a situation where you have uh, a notation definitely needs to be in red on the. Uh, CHR1. Now you don't have to go into all kinds of detail about that. You know, you called her six times, and you know, or you got returned letters. That you want to make a notation on the CHR1 that this is uh, unresolved. That that's that kind of like what we were talking about earlier about flagging the chart because you have not been able to get in touch with this patient. You need to flag that chart in red on the CHR1. Of course, you're going to record all that business about you tried and the letter was returned and undelivered and all that will be in your CHR 10 but on your CHR 1 you would write that um, that you've already written that they have this unresolved I mean that they have this abnormal result on here and so when it's never written on here that it's unresolved you can all right actually make a notation on the day that you get that returned letter certified letter or letter that's undeliverable, and you can say, unable to contact patient, um, PAP problem unresolved, or ma'am unresolved, and that lets the next person that picks that record up when they come in know that they need to address this with them when they come in. And, okay, and, thank you. Yeah, and just make sure that you're following through in the, in the follow-up chapter, the okay. steps to go through, and right. that, that'll lead you through. And, and I know when you're trying mm -hmm. to get in contact with someone and you know that their health is at risk, it's really hard to just, okay, I'm going through the, it says phone, it says letter, it says certified letter, I've done everything, I can really close it or I've done it, it it's hard to give up because we don't want to give up on our patients, we want to give them the best care, but just but, making sure you document and follow the steps in the follow-up chapter. And putting it on that CHR1 one. is a good place for that to be sure and not be missed should that patient walk back right. in the clinic again. These are good questions. Very good mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? I think that's got it. Well, we appreciate you all and yes. uh, really appreciate your uh, interest input. and your input. And we will talk about the um, redundancy of, of using that um, stamp again on the CHR 10, but I would tend to think that if we're going to try to have that sequential um, order, then the least that we'll probably have to do is just make sure that it's documented on the 10 that it was given on so-and-so on this date at the, fa at the family planning initial or family planning annual. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Great questions. I hope you all um, um, uh, got something from this and I, I would be glad to talk to anybody about the using the uh, tickler box uh, and where I got that from and where I got the tabs and all that type of thing. Um, so if you want to know that or if you'd like for me to send that out to you all, I can actually do that. I probably will just shoot you all an email and let you know where I got this and how you can uh, order the little tabs that go in between in that way. And you do have it in your uh, handouts where you get your tickler cards from, from the warehouse through Procurit. We do have one more call. We have okay. a quick call from Blount County. Okay, go ahead go with your ahead, question. Blunt. Yes, uh, my concern is that because of all of the extra documentation on the CHR1, we actually may use multiple CHR1s in the process uh, of the follow-up. And my question is, will we have some type of tab or something to show where everything originated so that we kind of won't get lost in all of the forms or all of the CHR1s? I don't understand. Well, I think... 
uh, let me make sure when in the directions that Valerie has documented, um, you're going to bring that forward. So let's say, I'm hearing an echo, um, you get to the bottom here and um, we've written all that we can do on this. You're done. So anything in red up here at the top has to be brought forward and onto a new, a new patient log. Anything that's unresolved. Unresolved. So you're not going to lose that because anything, you wouldn't bring forward this surgical referral. Because it's resolved. Because it's resolved. But, you know, she's got her diagnostic mammogram 2016. If everything else is normal and for some reason she's in a buku times before February 2016, the only thing, you know, that we're going to look at following up is that you'd bring that diagnostic mammogram forward. Okay, so maybe I missed that. So we're going to bring everything that's pending forward each time we start a new form. You are correct. Yes, anything, anything unresolved. That, anything that's unresolved um, that we would have on the CHR1 in red, that's correct. Okay, all right, that clarifies it. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Sure, thanks. Arlinda. That's all we got. That's it. I appreciate you all being here. and. If you email me, call me if you have any questions. Thanks. Just her. <laughs> <laughs>